Length and partials are all the hype these days. Some influencers have even referred to length and partials as causing stretch-mediated hypertrophy, and are making claims on that basis with regards to what muscle groups benefit or whether or not it benefits more advanced trainees. The bad news, I looked at the evidence and it's very unlikely that length and partials are causing stretch-mediated hypertrophy, but they do still cause more muscle growth. Here's why. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here today with Strong by Science, bringing you a video on stretch media hypertrophy and whether or not length and partials really do incur a meaningful amount of it. Importantly, much of the research for this video came from an article that is coming out soon or might already be out at the time of this video. If you'd like to check it out, the link will be in the description. Let's start at the very start, and that is to say when we first defined and observed stretch media hypertrophy. We need to make sure we understand what that is before we can establish whether or not length and partials do actually cause it. Stretch mediated hypertrophy is an increase in the size of sarcomeres as a result of some sort of stretching intervention. Sarcomeres are the smallest contractile units of muscle fibers. They are essentially what makes up muscle fibers. And sarcomeres themselves are composed of actin, myosin, and titan filaments, which allows your muscles to contract. Now, you know what stretch mediated hypertrophy is, but when did we first really start observing stretch mediated hypertrophy as something we need to care about? Well, back in the 1970s, a study by Sola and colleagues looked at this concept in birds. In this study, they attached one to 200 gram weights to birds' wings and specifically stretched out the lats and teres minor muscles. They did this in the context of both innervated muscles, muscles that still had functioning nervous systems, and denervated muscles, so essentially muscles that were unable to contract anymore. Why is this important? Well, hypertrophy can also occur from contracting a muscle, for example. When you're lifting weights, for instance, your nervous system is sending signals to your muscles to contract, produce active tension, and that active tension can cause hypertrophy. So to see how much hypertrophy was truly quote-unquote stretch mediated, that is to say it was specifically the stretching of the muscle that caused the hypertrophy, exposing denervated muscles to a stretching intervention should give us an estimate of how much of the hypertrophy observed was truly stretch mediated. And here are the results. In the muscle that was still innervated, that was also capable of contracting, they observed an increase in muscle weight of about 170%, which is dramatic hypertrophy. However, how much of that was truly stretch mediated? Because when you're stretching, for example, you might still be producing some active tension to avoid getting into an even deeper stretch. Your muscle is resisting the stretch load. But with a denervated muscle, where your nervous system is unable to send signals to the muscle to contract, we can estimate how much hypertrophy was truly stretch mediated. And while in this study, they still saw an increase in muscle weight of 140% even in denervated muscle. And so that tells us two things. 140% of that increase in muscle weight was attributable to just stretch mediated hypertrophy. The remaining 30% that distinguished between the innervated and denervated muscle seems to be attributable to active contraction. And second, this tells us that even when a muscle isn't being activated for contraction, it can still experience really robust stretch mediated hypertrophy. Importantly, there are differences between birds and humans, and that's what we'll get to in a moment. Before we do, let me point out that this isn't the only study that looked at stretch mediated hypertrophy in animals and found dramatic hypertrophy. A meta analysis by Warnicke and colleagues synthesizing all all the studies in animals in stretching interventions found that on average across these studies, stretching interventions led to hypertrophy of an effect size of 8.51. That is a huge effect size. That is an extreme amount of muscle growth. To give you some context of how things look in humans, in the average resistance training study where we actually have people lift weights, we see an effect size of around 0 0.3 or so. 0 0.3 versus 8.5 is a large difference. So there are huge differences in the amount of hypertrophy observed. It's not unheard of to see increases in muscle weight or size of two to 300% in this animal data. Now, why do we observe so much hypertrophy in these animal studies? Before I can explain that, let me give you a quick primer on how muscle is thought to grow. How does a muscle growth process occur? Muscle is thought to grow in two ways. One, by a creation of new muscle fibers. This is referred to hyperplasia, and in humans, it isn't fully understood yet. It isn't the main thing contributing to increases in muscle size in all likelihood. The second way is an increase in the size of existing muscle fibers. Now, that increase in size can come from two things. If you visualize a muscle as a cylinder, we can either increase the length of that cylinder, which is what we call longitudinal hypertrophy, or you can increase the diameter of that cylinder, which is what we call radial hypertrophy. Longitudinal hypertrophy can occur either through the addition of new sarcomeres, those functional units I referred to earlier, 
or the lengthening of individual sarcomeres within that chain. We generally think of increases in pination angle as representing an increase in radial hypertrophy. Conversely, increases in fiber or fascicle length are generally thought to represent longitudinal hypertrophy, which can occur, as I mentioned, through an increase of the number of sarcomeres in series or the lengthening of individual sarcomeres. With that primer out of the way, let's review how muscle growth occurred within this meta-analysis by Warnick and colleagues. First, across five studies, a substantial degree of hyperplasia or the addition of new muscle fibers was noted. Again, the evidence in humans is much less clear as to whether or not this occurs and to what extent. Additionally, they looked at increases in fiber length or longitudinal hypertrophy. And once again, across three studies, a very substantial hypertrophy was seen. All of these effect sizes were far outside the realm of what we typically observe in humans. And let me touch on that. To summarize, stretch mediated hypertrophy at its inception, how we first conceptualized it in animals, is characterized by three things. One, an insane amount of muscle growth being observed. Two, an increase in the number of muscle fibers present, also referred to as hyperplasia. And three, an increase in fiber length or longitudinal hypertrophy occurring. Importantly, all of these changes are quite dramatic within the animal data. All right, so on to humans. Is it a stretch to say that humans experience stretch mediated hypertrophy? Well, fortunately, we have quite a few studies looking at stretching interventions in humans and noting whether or not these same adaptations appear to occur. This was recently synthesized by a meta-analysis by Panidi and colleagues looking at the effects of stretching in humans on different factors. Minor increases in pination angle, fascicle length, and muscle thickness were noted in this data. Importantly, all of these changes became larger when the amount of stretching being performed across the week, say over an hour and a half versus under an hour and a half, increased and when the intensity of that stretch increased. Specifically, when it came to muscle thickness increases or increases in overall muscle size, these went from relatively trivial to more meaningful only when higher intensity stretching was performed. Going back to the denervated versus innervated muscle comparison, higher intensities of stretching are representative of a greater amount of active tension being produced by the muscle at those long muscle lengths. And so it seems like the amount of active tension being produced by the muscle in that stretch position is actually quite important when it comes to influencing how much hypertrophy is observed within humans. Whereas in the bird study I mentioned earlier, even in denervated muscle, much of the hypertrophy was still observed, suggesting it was truly stretch mediated. In the case of humans, that doesn't seem to be the case, as the intensity of stretching does seem to matter quite a bit. Importantly, there's a few other distinctions between the animal data and the human data when it came to stretching interventions. For one, the duration of stretching is generally much lower in the human data. That is for ethical reasons. Stretching out a muscle for hours and hours on end in any given day, for weeks on end, is a lot of burden on the subject. Additionally, while in animal studies we generally prescribe the amount of stretching as a certain weight or a percentage of their body weight, in human data it is usually based on pain ratings while stretching. And finally, as far as the actual adaptations being observed, how much muscle mass is being gained, how much of an increase in fascicle length there is, how much of an increase in pination angle there is, all of these things are dramatically larger in the animal data. Now, some of that will have to do with differences in interventions. As I mentioned, in animals, longer stretching durations, potentially higher intensities. And another key variable is that in animals, the rate of adaptations, essentially how quickly changes occur, is much faster than in humans. But nevertheless, the difference in the amount of muscle growth being observed is tremendous. And to give you an idea, an effect size of 0.1 with lower intensity stretching to 0.3 with higher intensity stretching is still a fair bit below what we commonly observe in the lifting research in humans. So the hypertrophy observed from stretching alone in humans is at best somewhat on par to more reasonably quite a bit below what you would see with lifting. Another important distinction, as I mentioned, is that we don't commonly measure hyperplasia within human studies. So the degree to which we see hyperplasia in humans as opposed to animals, where it's pretty apparent, is unclear. Similarly, in stretch mediated hypertrophy in animals, we observed a pretty dramatic increase in fiber length. In humans, we proxy this with fascicle length. Fascicles are essentially just arrangements of muscle fibers. And so fascicle length is thought to be a very good proxy for fiber length. And as I mentioned earlier, the amount of fascicle length increase we see in humans with stretching versus animals is much smaller. And so when it comes to the three hallmarks of stretch mediated hypertrophy in animals and how they translate to humans, they don't translate all that well. We do observe some hypertrophy, although quite modest. We do observe some increase in fascicle length, again, much more modest. And as far as hyperplasia goes, we're not even sure. And so stretch mediated hypertrophy in humans from just stretching are pretty modest. 
And how does this relate to length and partials? As I mentioned earlier, many of the benefits of stretching when it comes to muscle size are really only seen with pretty long durations of stretching. I'm talking often over an hour and a half of stretching a week at the longest possible muscle lengths. Meanwhile, when you're performing length and partials, you're spending an additional 10, 20, maybe 60 or more seconds per session in the lengthened position. And in fact, you're unlikely to even be spending that much time at the most lengthened position possible as you would during stretching interventions. And so across the whole training week, for a given muscle, we might be talking about an additional two to maybe five minutes of time spent in the lengthened position in these studies comparing full range of motion to length and partials. To illustrate this, in a study by Pedrosa and colleagues that compared length and partials or bottom half reps to shorten partials or top half reps to full reps in the length and partials group, they probably spent around an extra 130 seconds per workout in the lengthened position. Repetitions were performed with a controlled cadence and we know the duration of each rep, so we can roughly make a calculation as to how much more time was spent in that stretch position. And so, if we truly expect stretch-mediated hypertrophy to be occurring in humans with length and partials, we should expect that doing just 130 seconds of stretching quads per week would lead to as much more hypertrophy as was observed in this study from doing length and partials versus, for example, shortened partials. Again, the amount of force your muscles are producing in that length and position shouldn't matter, because stretch-mediated hypertrophy, in the truest sense, is observed even in denervated muscles that can't contract. And well, is this what we observed? Absolutely not. The amount of additional hypertrophy observed from doing length and partials was greater, far greater, than what you would expect from just stretching your quads for an additional two minutes per week. In the meta-analysis by Panidi and colleagues, for example, you need pretty long stretching interventions to see any appreciable stretch-mediated hypertrophy. So it seems quite unlikely, even extremely unlikely, that simple stretch-mediated hypertrophy is all that is occurring with length and partials and why they cause more growth. Let's quickly touch on another idea that's been floating around regarding length and partials, and that's that the additional hypertrophy from length and partials only occurs because you increase fascicle length. First of all, is this even true? Do we observe fascicle length adaptations consistently from lifting in humans? We performed a quick search of much of the literature out there on resistance training and how it impacts fascicle length adaptations. First up, increases in muscle size correlate but relatively weakly to both increases in fascicle length, that longitudinal growth, and increases in pination angle, or roughly speaking, radial hypertrophy. However, the correlation is only about 0.3. So muscle growth can occur alongside fascicle length increases and a alongside increases in pination angle, but can also occur in the absence of either one or both. What sort of training seems to cause increases in fascicle length in humans? While eccentric only training seems to increase fascicle length more than concentric only training or dynamic lifting. Conversely, concentric only training seems to increase pination angle more than eccentric only training. And generally, higher intensity training, such as performed with heavier weights and higher velocity contractions, will also increase fascicle length adaptations a little bit. We also then performed a search of the data on longer versus shorter muscle length training, trying to see whether longer muscle length training, one, consistently increases muscle size more, two, consistently increases fascicle length more, and three, consistently increases pination angle more than shorter muscle length training. The implication here is, which one is better for hypertrophy? Is one causing more radial hypertrophy than the other? And is one causing more longitudinal hypertrophy than the other? And it turns out that longer muscle length training does indeed consistently cause greater increases in muscle size, greater increases in fascicle length, but also greater increases in pination angle. One claim that's been made is that fascicle length increases or increases in longitudinal muscle mass are short-lived and essentially stop occurring after only a few weeks or a few months of training. And therefore, the implication is that if lengthened training is only helping you grow more muscle through increases in fascicle length, and these increases in fascicle length are short-lived on the order of only a few weeks or a few months, for more advanced trainees, longer muscle length training offers no benefit in terms of hypertrophy anymore. There's a few issues with that statement. Number one, while we do observe greater increases in fascicle length from lengthened training versus shortened training, we also observe greater increases in pination angle, suggesting that there is also greater radial hypertrophy, not just longitudinal hypertrophy, from lengthened training. And since increases in pination angle are pretty well documented to occur for a long time as you keep lifting, that means that lengthened training is likely still beneficial, even if only on account of the increases in pination angle in the long term. And so even for more trained lifters, it is likely still beneficial. And the second issue with this idea is that the current evidence doesn't support the idea that fascicle length increases only occur for a few weeks or a few months. While a few studies have shown more rapid increases in fascicle length in the first few weeks of training, 
other studies have found prolonged increases in vascular length. For instance, a 12-week study by Baroni and colleagues found increases in vascular length over 12 weeks. While the adaptations were greatest in the first eight weeks, they didn't stop altogether even in weeks 8 to 12. Similarly, a couple of studies by a research group by Anusaki and colleagues also found increases in fascicle length in highly trained samples of elite throwers. For context, in one of these studies, they were studying elite male throwers with an average squat run max of around 405 or 180 kilograms. And in the context of a 25-week training macro cycle, they still saw increases in fascicle length in this highly trained population. Similarly, in the second study, in the mixed sample of both males and females with an average squat max of 125 kilograms or 275 pounds, they also observed increases in fascicle length. And so, two takeaways from this research, really. One, length and training causes a bit more muscle growth on average, increases penation angle more on average, and increases fascicle length on average more. And two, even assuming that length and training does increase fascicle length more, the assumption that this is only a short-lived increase, and that after a few weeks of lifting, you don't get this benefit anymore, is unfounded. The research simply does not support that conclusion. And so, no, lengthened partials do not cause stretch-immediate hypertrophy in the traditional sense. But they do cause more muscle growth. And that muscle growth is likely to still occur even in more trained lifters. But part of the issue in discussing whether or not lengthened partials and lengthened training are more beneficial even in more trained lifters is that we don't have the research in trained lifters. So anyone telling you with absolute certainty that yes, lengthened training does not work in trained lifters, or yes, it absolutely works, is extrapolating. And that's why we're in the midst of conducting research in a more trained lifters to see whether or not lengthened partials are beneficial still in trained lifters. As it currently stands, no, lengthened partials do not cause stretch mediated hypertrophy. If anything, I think the evidence supports that lengthened training will still be beneficial for increasing muscle size, even in more trained lifters. So while we do need more studies, don't fall for the hype that lengthened training only benefits new lifters. That is the video. If you'd like a much more in-depth breakdown of this area of research, check out the full article. I'll have it down in the description. It is like 40 pages long. It breaks down all the research on the topic just so you can get the best understanding of this research. If you're like, nah, this video, it was quite long. It wasn't for me, to be honest. I would rather just someone take care of this stuff for me. We got you. Strongarmbyscience.com slash coaching has a team of expert coaches that can handle your training, your nutrition, or even just have a consultation with you to answer your questions. Do you want more information just like this? Check out the Strong by Science newsletter. Every few weeks, you'll receive an email with information on the latest scientific research. And finally, if you made it all the way here, comment below 42,617. And that's how I'll know you're a real fan of Strong by Science. In the meantime, once you've commented this, have a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves.